Morning once again to you all. If you take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, we're going to read from verse 31 through to verse 34. God's word reads as follows. Jesus took the twelve aside and told them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. On the third day he will rise again. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them. And they did not know what he was talking about. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Our gracious Lord, as we come now to your word, we ask for your peculiar and special grace to give us understanding, Lord. We read in the last verse there that the disciples did not understand what he was saying because it was hidden from them. Our Lord, we pray that you would not hide these truths from our hearts. But Lord, that our hearts would be opened up, that our spiritual eyes would be opened, that the truth of your word would be laid bare, that it would impact us, and that through this powerful word you would transform us. I pray that for both those who are in Christ right now and those who are not yet in Christ and do not know him personally as their Lord and Savior, and I pray, Lord, that you would be pleased to work even through the preaching of your word. For your name's sake, amen. One of the things that I've mentioned repeatedly as I've been preaching the last few sermons is that Jesus uh, is on his way to Jerusalem. He is busy on this journey towards Jerusalem. You recall that account where he said he had set his face resolutely towards Jerusalem. And so it is that he continues on this journey. And as he's going, he is relating matters concerning the kingdom. What does it mean? Uh, to be a part of the kingdom? What does it mean to participate in the kingdom of God? And last week, uh, we looked at something of that as we saw this rich young ruler coming to Jesus and saying that he wanted to enter the kingdom of heaven. And he said, what must I do, good teacher, to enter the kingdom of heaven? And essentially, this young man was prepared to do anything and everything to enter the kingdom of heaven except forsake his riches. And that's exactly what Jesus told him to do. Uh, Give away all that you have, sell your possessions, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. And so he was not prepared to sacrifice this. There was a sacrifice that he was not prepared to make. At the end of that passage, the disciples had said to Jesus that they had left everything in order to follow Jesus. And Jesus gave them a very gracious encouragement. He said that they would certainly receive their due reward, both in this life and in the life to come, eternal life. So he had given them their encouragement from that. But on the subject of sacrifice, that leads to the present text. And this text is referred to as Christ's third passion prediction. It's third passion prediction. Through the Gospels, there are three Passion predictions, what we can call passion predictions. And this is the third and final one of them. Essentially, this is a prediction of Jesus concerning the sufferings that he is going to face. When we speak of the passion of Jesus, it actually comes from the Latin word, uh, which means to face suffering. Okay, So it's speaking about the suffering of Jesus. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering. Jesus endured suffering. And so as Christ is walking with his disciples, and as his disciples have said to Jesus, you know, we've left everything to come and follow you, Jesus proceeds to outline the extent to which he will suffer for their sake. I think about Philippians chapter 2, which speaks about Jesus, uh, who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped and held on to. But he made himself nothing. And he was found in human likeness. And he took on the form of a servant. 
That is the condescension of Jesus, even as he's busy speaking to his disciples. And yet he was going to take that so much further. He would suffer for their sake. So this is the third passion prediction. Uh, The first one was in chapter 9 and verse 22, where it says, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised up on the third day. In chapter 9 and verse 43 through 45, it said, And they were all amazed at the greatness of God, but while everyone was marveling at all he was doing, he said to his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears, for the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this statement. And then we have this morning's text, which is the third passion prediction. Now, friends, as we consider these few verses, I want to remind us of the significance of the sufferings of Christ on our behalf. Christ knew full well that his suffering was coming. He understood even the extent of his suffering. As Jesus said to his disciples, or as the disciples said to him, well, we've given up everything, to a certain extent that was true. And yet they had not suffered at the hands of sinful men. They had certainly not suffered as righteous men. But here was Christ, about to lay down his life for his disciples, and he would do so through extreme pain and suffering. And at this point, he is explaining to his disciples what he is going to do. What is going to endure? Let us consider in this text, and firstly I want us to notice a predetermined plan. This is verse 31. There is a predetermined plan. Jesus took the twelve, says verse 31, and told them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. The first thing we see over here in connection with this passion prediction of Christ is that this passion prediction was reserved for a peculiar group of people, a special group of people, that is. It was reserved for the twelve. It was reserved for the disciples. It was not, reserved, it was not announced to all of the followers in terms of the revelation plans of God and His purposes. Christ didn't make all things known to all men. That is not His purpose even in our day. God chooses to reveal certain things to certain men and not to others. Some people will come to an understanding of the gospel and so be saved, and yet others will not. And this is in God's providential working for His glory, to display His glory. But even over here, the disciples are taken aside, and He tells these disciples that which must take place in the future. It's evident from this that Christ was, in le- at least in some measure, are seeking to impress upon these disciples the gravity of the events that were about to unfold. He was impressing this upon them. In the text, the the first word that comes out of Jesus' mouth over here is, Behold, the NIV doesn't have that word. If you've got uh, the English Standard Version, you'll see it says, See. Or in other versions, Behold. In other words, take note of this. Let this capture your attention. And then as he addresses his disciples, he explains to them that they are going up to Jerusalem. Now this is what would have been known as the city of God. This is the place where God dwelt among his people. And this was the place where the holy days were observed by the Israelites. They would go there for their holy observations, for their festivals that needed to be observed throughout the calendar year. One of the festivals indeed that they would observe or the holy days was the Passover feast. And this is the time that Jesus would ultimately be crucified at the time of the Passover. But it should be noted here that as Christ was heading up to Jerusalem, perhaps in the minds of the disciples, he was merely saying, well, we're going to Jerusalem to observe the Passover, or something along those lines. But Christ was going for so much more. Now notice that Christ wasn't merely going towards Jerusalem with his feet. Yes, he was walking to Jerusalem, certainly. But he was going with his heart. He had a resolve. He had a desire to go there. In Psalm 84 verse 5 it says, How blessed is the man whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. That's an interesting verse. In whose heart are the highways to Zion. In other words, that you love to go up and worship God. But if you think about this, And Jesus, as he was journeying towards Jerusalem, what was he doing? Well, he was going there in order to do the will of his Father. 
His heart was there. In John 4 verse 34, Jesus said to his disciples, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Christ's eyes were set resolutely on this goal. As he goes on and engages with his disciples, he says to them that everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. Now, we know that the Son of Man over here is a reference to the Messiah. We've looked at this previously in our study in Luke. It comes particularly from the book of Daniel, where it says you'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. And it speaks of this authority. And the Son of Man was a picture in the Old Testament for the Jewish people of the one who would come as the Messiah. And so Christ tells his disciples over here uh, that this Son of Man, the Messiah, everything that was written about him will be fulfilled. It says, as Jesus explains it, that it is everything written by the prophets. However, we need to understand that this went beyond just what the prophets said in terms of specific revelations about Jesus. If we look at Isaiah chapter 53, that's certainly an example of specific instances where there was a prophecy concerning the afflictions and the sufferings of the Son of Man. But we must keep in mind that essentially what Christ was saying here was that everything that was written concerning God's salvation plan was going to come to fruition and fulfillment in Him at Jerusalem. Everything would come to fulfillment. Think about Christ on that road to Emmaus. This is post His death and resurrection. He's walking on the road towards Emmaus with two disciples that are speaking about the events that have just unfolded. And Jesus says to them, O foolish men of slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into His glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, He explained to them the things concerning Himself in all the Scriptures. Everything was pointing toward this radical moment. Everything was heading towards that climactic point. That is, in essence, the focal point of God's redemptive purposes at the cross, where he will be taken just outside Jerusalem and put to death on behalf of people who had no hope. And he says that these things would be fulfilled. The fact is, Christ knew that everything that was written would come to fruition there was more to it, but one of the most important things that would be fulfilled was his suffering and his death, both of which were essential, critical for the salvation of mankind. Notice then, secondly, the painful prediction. The painful prediction in verses 32 to 33a. Christ proceeds now to speak to his disciples about what is going to happen in Jerusalem to the Son of Man. In verse 32 we read, He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. As you read that, notice the specificity in those words, the detail. Notice how much detail Jesus gives. This will happen. That will happen. That will happen. That will happen. And ultimately, he'll be killed. It is detailed. Many people uh, have been led to think that because of how detailed and specific it is, this was actually written post Jesus' death and resurrection. And it was sort of as if it was prophetic, but it was written in hindsight. That's not scripture. And Isaiah 53 proves that, doesn't it? All of the scriptures were pointing towards this. But notice what Jesus says is going to happen. The first thing that he says is, he's going to be handed over to the Gentiles. Now, a couple of things are worth noting on this point. We know well that up until this point, the Gentiles have no issue with Jesus. They don't have a concern with Jesus. They're not concerned about his life. Perhaps they like the idea of a man who can perform miracles Certainly, there were some miracles performed among the Gentiles. In fact, Luke is one of those who outlines that more than the other Gospels do. Uh, but it wasn't the Gentiles that were too concerned about Jesus. 
The Jews were. The Jews didn't like Jesus. Particularly the Jewish leaders, they were looking to have Jesus put to death. In that sense, it's interesting that Jesus doesn't say, oh, the Jewish leaders are going to put me to death. His prophecy is that I will be handed, or the Son of Man will be handed over to the Gentiles. Well, the reasoning behind that is because the Jewish leaders didn't actually have the authority to carry out the death penalty. They weren't allowed to put to death. In other words, it would be the Jews that would be behind his death. The Jews would hand Jesus over, the Jewish leaders would hand him over to the Gentiles in order to have him tried, in order to have him executed. And so in that sense, the Jews are behind and the Gentiles are somewhat involved, and they will be. But keep in mind that all of this is in perfect accordance with the providential working of God. In other words, although there were people behind this carrying out their own will, it was God who was at work over here to carry out His will and His purposes. In theological terms, if you want to learn a theological term, this is called a divine passive. Divine passive. Passive is something, uh, is a context where something is enacted upon a person. In other words, something happens to someone, something is done to them, but it's not them doing the action. Someone from outside is doing an action. That's a passive, right? A divine passive is when God is the one doing the action. In other words, God is acting to perform the action on the person. And so even over here, many have recognized the divine passive behind this phrase that Jesus says the Son of Man will be handed over. Yes, the Jews will do it. But God is behind this, working out His purposes and plans, even as those Jewish men desire to do this. Isn't that what the book of Acts says in chapter 2 and verse 22 and 23? It says there, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Here was the providential working of God. This was God's salvation plan. And you know what? The world mocks this. I've heard men say in the world, Oh, God put God to death. Yes. God put His own Son to death in order to bear our suffering and shame upon Himself. And the wrath that was due to us was placed on Him. Yes, it was by the hands of evil men. But God is a sovereign God, working out His plans on purposes in order for reconciliation to take place. With that said, Jesus goes on now to tell His disciples, once He's handed over, what is going to take place? What is going to take place? And He gives a few details here. He says, firstly, they're going to mock Him. They're going to mock Him. The first detail that he gives here is that they will insult him, mock him. And think now, dear friends, that here is the one who, according to Colossians 1 verse 16, is the one by whom and through whom all things were made. All things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and through him. That is the one who is now telling his disciples that these Created beings are going to take him and put him to death, and, or they're going to mock him firstly. Friends, he's the one worthy of all honor and glory and praise and adoration. Children, think about this children's talk that I was doing this morning and how you sometimes uh, are teased at school or you are mocked or you are bullied and you think to yourself, you don't deserve it. Well, here is Jesus, the one who created all things worthy of this honor and praise and glory and worthy of our greatest adoration. And he says to his disciples, I'm going to be mocked. He knows that as he goes to Jerusalem, this is going to happen to him. He will face the scorn. He will face the con contempt. From our perspective, if we face that, what do we do? Well, if we've got the power, we will put an end to it. 
That's our natural response. We want to stop people that want to do that to us. But Christ was heading there resolutely. This mocking that he prophesied here would certainly come to pass. I will just outline one or two of the verses which show these prophecies actually coming to fulfillment. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 63, we read, Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him and beating him. A little further on in Luke chapter 23 and verse 11, it says, And Herod with his soldiers, after treating him with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. And a couple of verses later in chapter 23 and verse 36, we read, The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him and offering him sour wine. Group after group, heaping insults, mocking Jesus. The next word over there that Jesus uses is that they would insult him. The word insult can also just be to mistreat. They will mistreat him. It's a word that Paul used in 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 2 to describe that he, the way that he was mistreated in Philippi, where he was put in jail. It's the same word used in Acts chapter 14 and verse 5 to speak about the plans that the people had to mistreat Paul and Barnabas as they were seeking to proclaim the gospel. There is this mistreatment. Very clearly, this is a, a general mistreatment of a person. And Christ certainly throughout this passion, suffering week faced such mistreatment and insult. Next, he says, they will spit on him. Now think about this, friends. You know, you can make some prophecies and say, well, I'm going to go there and this person's going to do this and this person's going to do that. But to line up these details, each one of them quite specifically, and then to have them all fulfilled. Jesus knew what he was facing. They will spit on him. That comes to fulfillment. We see it in Mark 14, verse 65. Some began to spit at him and to blindfold him and to beat him with their fists and to say to him, prophesy. And the officers received him with slaps in the face. Later on in Mark's gospel, chapter 15 and verse 19, it says, they kept beating his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling and bowing down before him. That was in mock worship, mock adoration, mock honor. Christ tells these disciples, I'm going there and they are going to spit on me. They're going to flog him is the next word that he uses here. This would come to fulfillment in Mark chapter 15 and verse 5, 15, sorry, where it says, Wishing to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas for them. And after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. And then the ultimate point of this, they would kill him. They would kill him. Indeed, this was the event towards which everything was pointing. The killing of the very Son of God. And as Christ was on the cross being crucified, think about those words that he spoke. It is finished. It is finished. All that was spoken of through the prophets, that was spoken about through me, it is finished. And John 19.30 says, after he had said this, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Even in those words of his death, Jesus would affirm all that was prophesied about him was being fulfilled. The words of William Hendrickson are helpful at this point in drawing our minds to see something of the weight that this must have placed on Jesus as he spoke these words. William Hendrickson writes, even this third prediction though indeed very comprehensive and detailed, does not necessarily prove that in the mind of Jesus the image of impending distress was already as vivid as it would be in Gethsemane. Nevertheless, even now the horror must have been very real and very terrifying. The man of sorrows sees it coming toward him. He already senses something of the perfidy, the hypocrisy, the calumny, the mockery, the pain, and the shame which like an avalanche threatens to overwhelm him. Yet, he does not retreat or even stand still. With unflinching determination, he walks right into it, for he knows that this is necessary in order that his people may be saved. Having loved his own, he loved them to the uttermost. John 13, 31, sorry, 13, verse 1. 
Dear friends, this was indeed what was driving Jesus Christ forward. His deep love for His chosen ones. But notice what Christ also speaks of over here, and that is a powerful victory. A powerful victory. That's our third point over here in verse 33b. At the end of verse 33, Jesus says, On the third day He will rise again. He will rise again. There was no doubt the comfort that Christ took even as he looked forward to what was about to unfold for him. He saw the impending mockery and scorn and the floggings and the death, but he knew there was a victorious outcome. The sufferings that he would face would indeed be painful, even more so because they were utterly undeserved for him. He did not deserve them. Nonetheless, he looked to the goal and he considered what the outcome of this would be, and this encouraged him to persevere. Hebrews 12, 2 says that Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising its shame. He endured it. Christ knew that victory would come, and thus he was prepared to endure the suffering. Christ knew that he was about the Father's business and that his will was to do the will of his Father. And that was to redeem a people for himself. And therefore he was able to endure. Friends, let me just make one point of application over here. We are called to do very similar in our own lives. We are called as Christians to endure the hardship, the shame, the suffering, the contempt, the self-sacrifice because of that which lies ahead. Let me read Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, in which I quoted that brief section on Jesus enduring the shame. It speaks actually to us. And the author of the letter to the Hebrews says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, that is all the great fathers of the faith who by faith endured, it says, since we have that cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Here is encouragement for us. Dear friends, if we, if we live our lives fixing our eyes on this world and trying to avoid and prevent and do away with the, the conflict or the, the hostility or the shame that is brought on us, particularly when it's for the name of Christ, but just in general, if, if, we, if we try and minimize that and downplay it, it's because we've lost sight of the ultimate goal. We ought to follow in those steps of Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith, who endured that because he saw what was coming. So too we endure because we know we have a certain hope. And so we persevere in this life. Fourthly and finally, notice verse 34, a profound dullness. A profound dullness. As Jesus explains these things to the disciples, we find that they didn't actually understand what he was saying. In verse 34 we read, but the disciples understood none of these things. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. There is this almost a blanket statement that they didn't understand anything here, the smaller details. Certainly they didn't place this thing in its proper context and understand what Jesus was getting at. One reason was very likely their grandiose notions of the Messiah and what he was coming to do. They were anticipating this glorious Redeemer that would deliver them from the hands of the empires and the nations and would set them up and establish this glorious kingdom. And so they were anticipating this in Jesus. When you see in this, dear friends, that so often people are blinded by their own preconceived misconceptions. That certainly seems to be at play over here with the disciples. Uh, they, they, their eyes were closed. They didn't understand it. 
In a sense here, they were still blinded, and that's where that verse comes in, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see. Now, God makes able to see, and God sometimes allows people to remain for a time in blindness. I think that's what was at play over here. Jesus had spoken to them, he had revealed, and in fact, he had revealed in quite some plain detail what was going to unfold. It was quite specific, as we've seen. And yet they didn't understand it. They knew that this was the Messiah. They knew Jesus was the Son of Man. They had made that profession that you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And yet, as he explained what was going to happen to the Son of Man, they didn't connect the dots. They just couldn't understand this. It didn't make sense to them. Now, friends, very often people in our own day have their own preconceived notions of God of the gospel, of God, of what, what God should be doing in the world, how God should treat people, how God should and shouldn't act or behave in this world, what would or would not constitute God's love, and therefore what is and what isn't true. And if there is even a God, because they will say, that doesn't make sense. Preconceived notions lead them to this blindness and I would suggest that even sometimes Christians fall into their trap of approaching God in this way. Certainly they don't, they're not unsaved, they, they, they're believers, they, they know the gospel, they understand it. But when it comes to those hard tests, and think about suffering, that's probably one of the harder things when, when you're facing persecution or suffering. Are we going to then believe what God says? That doesn't make sense. We can't come to the text with preconceived notions. Charles Simeon is helpful here. One commentator, he writes, to counteract this fatal evil of preconceived notions blinding us, he says, to counteract this fatal evil, I would earnestly entreat all to lay aside their preconceived notions and to come to the sacred volume, the Scriptures, not as critics to sit in judgment upon God, but as little children to be instructed by Him. And opening that blessed, on opening that blessed book, we should lift up our hearts to God and pray with David, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Friends, when we come to the Scriptures, we must ask God, Please, open our eyes. Open my mind. Give me understanding. Let me not sit as a critic over your word. We must humbly accept this word of God. However, we need to also notice that their eyes were blinded in the providential working of God. Luke clearly conveys that in the way that he says these words. It was hidden from them. Well, who hides it from them? God hid it from them. In God's providential working, he chose, at least at this stage, to hide the meaning of what Jesus' words were to his disciples. Now, you might ask, well, what's the point of telling the disciples something if you're just going to hide the meaning from them? Well, the reason was that the, word, the meaning would not be hidden forever. It would be revealed to them in due, in due course, in due time. In John chapter 16 and verse 4, Jesus said, But these things I have spoken to you, so that when the hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. These things I did not say to you at the beginning, because I was with you. In other words, what Jesus says over here is that when the hour comes, I am going to reveal these words to you, it takes me, my mind to, it's Matthew's gospel, I believe, and, and, and could it could be in John chapter 2, but it says essentially that Jesus, that Jesus spoke about this, um, I think it was the destruction of the temple, and after three days it would be built up again, and the meaning there was hidden from them until after his resurrection, then these things came to their minds. In other words, God will allow our eyes to be closed perhaps for a time. But in His perfect timing, He will take back that veil and we will see things as they are. Now think about this, parents, as you raise up your children, teach them the truth of the Word. Even if they seem to not understand, even if they seem to not be comprehending, keep on teaching them, keep on showing them, keep on guiding them. And God, in His perfect timing, can remove the blinders from the eyes that they might see. 
And we need to appreciate, dear friends, through this truth that spiritual sight is a gift of God. In other words, if, if your eyes have been opened to the truths of the gospel, praise God. Do you praise God for that? Honestly, humbly, thank you, Lord. But for your grace, I would yet be blind. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Amazing grace. It's His grace. As we begin to close, a couple of points of application. There are a number of reasons, dear friends, that we must be grateful for these sufferings of Christ. The first of those is that Jesus' sufferings were substitutionary. In other words, he was the substitute that stood in our place. Now, this is only true of those who have confessed their sin, repented of that sin before God, and professed Christ as Lord. This is not applicable to those who acknowledge Jesus even. They might even say, well, Jesus was a great teacher. Well, Jesus did great things. That's not the point. Yes, that's true. But is Christ yours? Has he cut you to the heart? As you've seen your own sin before a holy God, have you seen that? Has it broken you? And have you thus humbled yourself and cried out to God and said, please forgive me? As the tax collector did, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. That is the gospel. If that is you, then Christ's suffering for you was substitutionary. In other words, he endured the suffering that you ought to have. He went through the mockery and the pain that you deserved. He endured the, the wrath of God poured out upon him that you and I deserved. Dear friends, this must lead us to thanksgiving. This must lead us to thanksgiving. We need to keep coming back to the cross in our lives as Christians. We need to keep coming back to saying, God, I thank you for what you've done for me. To live with ingratitude as a Christian is to spurn the gift of God through Jesus Christ. We must live thankful lives before God. We get to live thankful lives before God because of what he's done. Secondly, we must remember that his suffering was done willingly. Christ went to the cross because it was his Father's good pleasure, and yet he chose to endure that. He willingly went. As he said, I, he could have called down legions of angels to rescue him, but he didn't. He endured it willingly. For you, for me, despite the extent and the gravity of our sin, and what we've done, and what we even continue to do as believers. Christ willingly went to the cross, knowing what we do, knowing how we continue to spurn Him at times. Oh, may the Lord make our hearts grieve over our sin, that we would not continue in it. And His suffering was perfect and complete. His suffering was perfect and complete because of this. There is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. But dear friends, if you have understood this, if your eyes have been opened and you've understood this gospel and you've repented of your sin, there is a burden placed upon us. There is a call given to us. We are called, yes, to repent and believe, but now we are called also to follow we are called to follow Jesus. We don't merely come to Jesus and say, I want to get forgiven of my sin. I want this atoning sacrifice to work for me and cleanse me and purify me so that I might continue to live self-centered life. Jesus has said, we've seen this, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. He set the example. Not only did he humble himself, by coming into this world, but he humbled himself to the point of being a servant and then dying on our behalf. 
I'll close with the words of 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21 through 25. Where Peter writes, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. Dear friends, let me ask you this morning, are you following Jesus Christ? Are you sacrificing, living a life of self-sacrifice, denying yourself, even if that means suffering for His name's sake? That is what He calls us to. It is a high calling, but it is a glorious calling. It is a humbling calling, but it is an exhilarating calling. It is a painful calling in this life, but it is a victorious calling in the life to come. Dear friends, let us persevere in following our Lord, our Savior, because He suffered and endured on our behalf. Let's pray together. Our gracious God, we thank You for Your Son, the Lord Jesus. We thank You for Him taking His twelve disciples aside, even as these crowds were following Him. We thank You for the way that He told them about what he was about to face and yet he did not turn his face away and run the other way he endured that he endured the shame he endured the mockery he endured the scorning of man sinful man so that he would die in our place father god we pray that you would impress these truths on our hearts once again So often we become complacent, we downplay the truth of these words, we downplay the power of the gospel in our lives. Our Lord, we pray that you would give us a deeper sense of our own sin, give us a deeper sense of your holiness, give us a deeper desire and longing to walk in your ways. Please, Lord, help us. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for Christ being willing to suffer on our behalf. Cleanse us, we pray. Purify our hearts. Your word has said that if we will confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. We thank you for that and we pray that in light of this, we would live lives of thanksgiving and deep gratitude for your name's sake. Amen. We're going to stand and